So welcome aboard, everybody. I've got an old mate of mine, Martin, here. Martin, fun enough, and I were cricket fellows at school. Martin was the year above me at school. We played cricket together, and I hadn't seen or heard of him for years until I sat in the in my check ride, i.e., my my final exam on the seven three seven for Thompson, and Martin was sat as the examiner in the back and. I looked at him and thought, I do recognize you. And obviously, we <laughs> suddenly realized that, which was one of those bizarre moments, yeah. wasn't it, Martin? But welcome, Martin. Lovely to see you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, it was an interesting briefing for a, a you know, normal Czech rider, a fairly formulaic. But after a while, I was like, we sure I've played cricket with you. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it made, made, made some fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then, interestingly, that was, I think, probably 2007. You've now come to the dark side or the bright side as well, like me, the corporate world. And Martin and I both now fly the Gulfstream 600, coincidentally. And in fact, I was, we were looking to do some, you, you asked me to do some freelance with you in the summer, which I, we couldn't manage, but hopefully we'll get around to doing that. But give us a little bit of a summary of your career so far, Martin. Um, so yeah, I started flying uh, when I was at university, joined the University Air Squadron, uh, and I enjoyed that. Uh, and then so I actually went and joined the Air Force initially, uh, did some flying training there. And unfortunately, I got a hernia through my training, which obviously uh, disrupted it and uh, had quite a bit of time off. And then at a time when the Air Force were kind of cutting budgets, as probably are st still doing today, um, I, I had a three or four hours to get back to standard. And I, I never achieved it, unfortunately. So uh, obviously, massive disappointment as sort of my set my heart on it from a young child's uh Time. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, I went out and completed my civil licences at uh, Oxford in about '95. Uh, then spent a year sort of unemployed, doing other jobs, trying to get a, my your first break in the pilot world. And then um, got a call whether I wanted to join this uh, startup uh, airline uh, um, called EasyJet with nice orange jets, which everybody said at the time was never going to work. Uh, <laughs> with a, Ended up with a staff number of 20 and, uh, yeah, carried on from there. So I um, enjoyed my time with EasyJet, um, pro progressed quite quickly through training first officer in command and captaincy, and then um, other back into the sim training as well. And then went, um, oh, I was offered a job at CTC Aviation. So I joined that, uh, it was about 2003, four uh, era, and did some training with them, as Ben remembers, uh, my TRE there. And then it was then I got into sort of management and ended up doing uh, ops director for for the commercial side. So organising all the training and sims for delivering training to, well, EasyJet was obviously one customer, but half a Lloyd Thompson, as you said, as you know, um, BA and all sorts. And then later on, I think probably around about 2009 or 10, um, had a sort of reorganisation. I ended up uh, running the cadet side of the business or the cadet training side of the business uh, which is everything in the end from recruitment um into the uh into the into the scheme uh or as well as all the instructors and aircraft uh, throughout the world because by the time we finished in or well, the time i finished in 2016 we had um you know, aircraft in new zealand and good year in states and classrooms up in coventry as well as down in uh, southampton where we're based so yeah it's quite a big operation and then 2016, I decided I'd like to go back to flying. So I got my management gloves and um, picked up my flying ones. And that's why I got into the corporate aviation world. Yeah, it's a, it's such an, uh, well, for me, I know we're similar age and we are flying the same air, aircraft now. For me, that's, that's a really impressive route. I mean, to join EasyJet, I love the way you say the startup airline. I mean, it's just phenomenal you, to, to see the difference from that point, but I mean, it was quite a it was quite a turnaround to be kicked out effectively of the of the what your dream of joining the air force just because of something that you couldn't have controlled with your hernia, and then to find yourself now. I mean, how does that? Do you yeah, ever I reflect? Mean, it, it, yeah, how far? Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, 
Yeah, I did. And obviously at the time, um, because you had loads of friends who had gone from university into the Air Force and some of them had stayed and some of them had gone and you sort of compared yourself to them. Um, and obviously it was a, a massive blow to uh, confidence and um, my outlook and everything I want to do. So you kind of look quite inwardly at yourself and think, do I really want to put myself through that? Um, am I good enough? Um, luckily I had some good friends and I sort of went and saw some old instructors and said, you know, do I have the ability to do this? And they said, yeah, you do. Um, uh, it's just kind of got to pick yourself up and sort of find the right way to do it. And, you know, actually whilst it was massively disappointing at the time, um, it didn't take me too long to think, actually, I, I do still want to fly and I've just got to find a way of getting myself over that line and getting that license. And then once you've got the license, you realize actually what you need now is a job and you've got to battle your way through that. And that's like, that took 15 months or so of, uh, and in the interim, you kind of do a whole lot of other jobs, which make you appreciate what you end up doing <laughs> now a whole lot more. Absolutely. I mean, that's the key. I was similar probably after I finished, we both went to Oxford. I think I was two years behind you. It took me, I think, 15 months. Most of the people that I graduated with had had got jobs by that stage. And I, I, I'd had my ups and downs in terms of confidence, was was underconfident for the first 25 years of my life, thinking I'd never, I was never smart enough to be a pilot, decided to do it. That passion, that interest, that desire drove me forward. I didn't even pass my PPL on the first occasion. I screwed up the landing, so I only got a partial pass on my PPL. Yeah. Same thing at Oxford on my commercial license, only got a partial pass. And you go through those stages of thinking, yeah, this is great. But that 15 months after training was quite a hit, watching everybody else succeed. But I think like you, you just I hung on to my passion and thinking this is what I want to do and I will find a way somewhere i know that you've had your ups and downs even since then i mean training on tight ratings you've had some you had some issues as well didn't you yeah yeah i mean it was um i, I guess partly because you had nothing to compare it to i, I mean if, if you've got a long uh, i'm not sure too many people have a history of, of training but certainly I, I remember doing the sim phase um and we had some awful slots like in the middle of the night and um in the morning, getting up, having had about three hours sleep, they start hoovering outside your room, and um, going down and looking through the appointment section of the, the papers to find <laughs> what jobs could I apply for. This, this was not going well. Um, and yeah, it's 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 you know a, a phrase they talk about quite a bit in airline training is sort of resilience to that. Um, and um, actually, I, I probably wasn't very confident, but somehow I found the resilience within me to do it and. I was with a with a with a partner who's is a lovely guy. Um, and it's, he got through as well, uh, and, and he he was a similar mindset to me. So we weren't kind of raging alpha male, kind of we can get this. We're the best in the world. We're both sort of looking in with thinking, am I good enough? <laughs> can I do that? Um, mm. And it is a good question. You sometimes think too far ahead and and actually kind of focus on your task. Where actually, what the guys actually asked me to do is take off. I know he's we got a whole load of other bits to go through later on, but folks on the task at hand, it was real kind of stepping, you know, one foot step in front of another to get through some of that. Um, and you, know, you, you pass the test and then some gradually your confidence grows, I think, um, as you go through through life. And, uh, you know, at, uh, one, one of my um, instructors in the Air Force when it wasn't going well sort of said to me, I want you to be more confident. and kind of reflecting on that a bit it was he might as well said I want to be you know a foot taller I, I didn't feel I could I, I could do much myself about that um I can have the right attitude but um if I was doubting myself you can't not automatically stop doubting yourself and it, it I, I kind of understand what he said but you know look looking back now you know 20 30 years later as an instructor you kind of think I would never have said that um whilst I probably would have had the same probably uh, frustrations as an instructor to do a trainee or, or desire to improve, but there, there would have been better ways perhaps he could have affected that change. And, and that that's kind of the, you know, some of the lessons you take out of life. And when you start training yourself, you have a bit of a, a bit more sympathy or empathy with the trainee um, um, to actually get them through. And maybe it was a factor that I was quite young when I was doing the training at, 
at EasyJet particularly, that I had a lot more empathy and I kind of viewed it almost as yeah, uh, coaching. I mean, as I was young training, I was probably a bit a bit too eager to impart knowledge and, and try and find the kind of the perfect answer. But actually, uh, as you get older and more mature, you're actually reflecting. It's actually about the individual, getting the individual to that, that point. And sometimes, you know, a lot of the most people it is about building their own confidence and their ability to do it uh, and letting their confidence enable their, their knowledge and ability to shine through. Because often perhaps it's a, the lack of confidence can be a bit of a barrier. Yes, I think so. I mean, that's the key. I'm a, I'm a mindset and confidence coach. And I, similar to you, I struggled with those areas of my life. They hit you very emotionally, of course. And you remember those things. The things we remember the most are the emotions, whether they be mm. struggling emotions or incredibly joyful, happy, brilliant emotions. So if we have the emotional understanding and the, and the mat emotional maturity, and the interest in those around us, then we can take those struggle, those struggles ourselves and impart them on other people, as well as the joy of it all. And I think that for me is when somebody's struggling, is not to concentrate so much on the struggle, it's it's turning it around into the, the beauty of how they will feel when they get through it, because it's that mm. that smallness that holds them back down again. And I think I mean I do remember you you don't remember my the check ride for me because you, you were just clocking them off, ticking them off however many a month. But for me, of yeah. course, it was a big it was a, a big moment in my career passing the seven three seven check ride. So I remember it very much more than you did. But I, I remember the relief of being, well, certainly knowing you and I thought, well that I've automatically got the right side of this examiner. But I've also I, the feeling was that you were there for my best interests in order to see me through because you're geared towards that. Whereas less confident, less emotionally empathetic individuals will like to, impart, as you say, impart their knowledge and try and prove and perform and on type brilliant and be the alpha male, which of course doesn't serve anybody. It just keeps everybody small. And actually there's that lovely story you, you, you've told me about the the um, couple of the candidates who had passed their 737 check ride and had gone out and then they started to struggle on the line. So they were fine in the simulator, but out in the real world, I thought that was lovely yeah. and how you, how you dealt with them. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I think um, confidence, I think, plays a huge amount in in life, but certainly in piloting. And, and when you're learning something new, um, you if, if you can attack it with some confidence, I think you, you do well. But it, when you're doing something new, it's very easy for someone with uh, more experience and knowledge uh, to basically pick holes in what you do. And um, we, we used to have a, you know, a number of you know, cadets, um, generally cadets who struggle to land the aircraft. And this is after they've done their, their base training. So they've actually gone out on the air and finished their sim. They've finished their uh, final sim check, gone out onto the aircraft, done the required six landings, been signed off as safe. And then halfway through their, their line training, you know, have been told they can't, or been put back into the sim training system saying, oh, this guy can't land, um, which again, kind of, for a training point of view, if, if I was never running the training point system, but you kind of think maybe the training system, you look at yourself and say, what's hold the mirror up there and say, well, what, what's, what's gone and wrong there? Uh, I mean, I never got that far to it, but what, what I used to do um, uh, with the, the guys I used to have was, was basically make them do two or three landings. Uh, and if there was a technical issue, which was very rare, um, and they put three decent landings in, then we just kind of used to sort of take off from Gatwick again and then fly under the bridge and try and land on the other end of the runway and then do that. And uh, whilst it was kind of a bit of light relief and filled in the hour, um, it, it actually had a, a bit of a, a serious point. In fact, that gave them real confidence in actually handling the aircraft at low level. Uh, and, you know, I think you could fly under Tower Bridge and stuff like that. And then I'll do a few more landings, three more landings, maybe with a bit of crosswind. And, you know, see, so you did that, handled that nicely. Right, let's go off. Uh, you can see that road over there, see if you can land on the M25, off you go, brilliant. Well done, let's go and land back in. And and actually, they A, enjoyed the session. Hopefully, for coming back to your point, the emotion of it was actually, that was quite good fun. And, and B, actually, I can land this, I can fly this airplane, and actually, I landed it okay. Um, so, it, 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 yeah, <laughs> well, selfishly, it made it much more fun for me. Um, 
but actually we had a good time. They came out of there, hopefully with their confidence boosted and, and then went off and, and I, I, I struggle to recollect anybody who didn't pass after that. So that, you know, kind of perhaps it, perhaps it worked then, you know, um, but it was a good, it was a good way and perhaps a good indication that actually this confidence is, is certainly when you've got no experience to hang your hat on the confidence of, of, um, being able to put these things together and actually come up with a good outcome is, is what needs to be nurtured perhaps more than the technical, you know, what you're actually doing and how much rudder you're putting in. I think that's absolutely bang on. You talked about fun there for me, of course, if we're relaxed and we're enjoying ourselves, then we have the capacity to take on so much more when we're feeling unsure about ourselves, everything closes in. I mean, it's the classic thing. Tunnel vision, we talk about in an aeroplane. I can't remember if there's another technical term that the psychologists talk about. That it's, that classic, it's that classic thing. When your limbic system, the ancient brain, fight and flight system is kicking in, it needs just to concentrate on either fighting the lion coming towards you or running away. So it's going to shut everything else down. You just don't have that capacity to, to make the most. So when we're gripped in that emotional hijack, as I call it, the ability to actually perform well is so small and it takes somebody who understands those emotional triggers, who can feel it themselves, recognize how what's held them back, like you, you've continued to, to, re, to reinforce this, understanding that actually you've got to take somebody out of their this basic system of operating and add a bit of fun. I think that's inspired. I've certainly yeah. I've never been in the training role myself, but 26 years down the line, I've done an awful lot of training and worked out where I perform better. And it's someone who, who just doesn't, there is no grade at all. Yeah, they might have a bit more experience and got a few more certificates, but they're completely on the same level, understand that we're all connected in some sort of way. We're all in each other's, we're all doing things for each other's interests. And I find that massively powerful. And I've absolutely mm. thrived in those environments. And I think in, the, in contrast to those who, clearly struggle themselves, have got themselves into those positions of, of authority, got the trophies, whatever, but are still struggling to hang on. They don't have the capacity to allow, well, to allow themselves to think, how will I, what can I do to understand this particular individual that's going to benefit them? They want to just stamp a, a basic idea on, on them. And, and of course, it's just limiting for everybody. So, yeah. For, for me, yeah, that, 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 I mean that, that's that's quite interesting. That was to, to, well, I mean, I, I can ref reflect. <laughs> there was one guy who had a particularly bad reputation as a, a, a tough trainer, and actually, I ended up doing a training course with him. And what became evident was how underconfident he was. Um, you know, perhaps kind of an insight into the the gruff old, you know, hard bastard trainer it was actually I, I was almost absolutely flabbergasted that he, he was so underconfident of actually flying or or doing it himself or whether he was doing a good job I thought oh, I just I just never saw that coming and actually also the other point was sort of come on to you about training now I mean I I actually enjoy going in the scene because I'm uh the guys who train us um as you say it's I think in a way I think the training captain is probably of an old term i think we'd much better be called a coach <laughs> because he kind of actually we're on a level because we're doing the same job and i'm actually here to help you be better than what you are now and um you know i, I think you know uh, i haven't trained cadets for a long time but i mean there probably is more involved in training a cadet but um uh but actually, even that, it's, it's still effectively coaching. When you get to line training, you're coaching. I think if you say you were a 737 coach, it would be quite an interesting, interesting <laughs> mindset <laughs> swift to, to a lot of training. Cow not, not, I mean, certainly the, the gruff old guys who do it, perhaps for not, not necessarily the best reasons. It, it kind of it actually puts you more on a level. I think that, that actually taint term coach would be quite a new thing in the industry. But you kind of shallow that, that, um, that grade it a little bit, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'd like the idea of that because that means I don't have to actually get my training qualifications. I'm a, I'm a coach. I've got a certificate. <laughs> yeah, you're already there. You're already there. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, I was just thinking about that because you're talking about the cadets. Obviously, there is a, 
degree of experience, diff difference in experience there. When we get to do the job that we do now, we often fly with other captains. And that has a whole different dynamic as well, because there isn't that gradient of the captain and the co-pilot or the first officer. So it, I found that interesting, and because I'm interested in the psychology of it, how other people, I, I've been in operations where I'm far more experienced than Gulf Streams coming in, but somebody's been in the operation much longer, and I can immediately see a flash in their eye that they see me as a potential threat. So how they deal with that is I'm thinking, okay, this, this, I'm going to struggle with this. They're going to find fault in everything I do. They're going to tell me I'm turning the switch off in the wrong order and whatever it is. And of course we try and stick to our standard operating procedures, but the emotionally smart person will not just pick holes in somebody just because they got one thing around the wrong way, because then of course you're breaking down the communication between mm. the crew members and then that has a, a safety implication apart from having the fun. And then, of course, the cycle goes around. If you're not having fun, then you're going to be limited in what you can do. So how do you, how do you, have you, having spent all those years in the airline and then now coming into the corporate world where you're flying with captains, what have you, what's your experience on that? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably quite lucky in that um, I've, I've, I've worked uh, for the operator, same operator at present for 10, 11 years now. Uh, and I'm lucky also the team we have with us are actually, um, you know, they're pretty open. And I think we're all, we're all of a mindset where we're actually kind of, we're all in this together. So um, I, I think the only time I've come across it or, or seen it a little bit perhaps is in um, freelancers, we've brought freelancers in and generally they're on the defensive. So I, I'm actually probably on the other side of that curve. So um so I'm not sitting there saying, no, we don't do it like that, mate. No, we don't do it like that. Because that's going to make A get on their wick. And me and my natural effect, I think, well, or maybe I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. so um, you know, it, um, we flew with a guy actually quite recently. And because the 600 is a fairly new aircraft and he's 600 uh, rated as well. And um, uh, it was, I found it really beneficial because he kind of did a few things which went, Oh, that's, that's quite the way. Why do you do that? Um, you know, one was, because that's what it says in the book. Like, oh, really? <laughs> um, and then I think, well, why, why aren't we doing it? And, and the other was like, well, kind of, we, we think that's a better way. Like, oh, okay. So you go away and we had a chat about it. So it's, maybe it's the way you can approach that. It's, it's actually, I learned that. I think that whole thing is a learning experience where other people might take as a threat. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we've had, I sort of have coached new people onto the aircraft and, um, I guess perhaps is one of the things you learn when I, I kind of learned, um, I was managing the flying instructors, the uh, light aircraft instructors, where I knew absolutely nothing about what they do, but I can understand their mentality and I know what good training looks like and, and conversely what bad training looks like as well. Um, to actually, uh, perhaps think, well, actually, you, you probably know more about this than I do. Um, and actually make myself open to, um, gaining from their knowledge uh, and yeah, building a stronger team that way. Mm. Yeah, I think that's bang on. It reminds me of the, the book uh, uh, Robin Sharma, who's, who um, uh, wrote the, I don't know, yeah, the, the 5 a.m. club, very a brilliant book. And he talks about the fact that true leaders have, are so confident that they don't need to advertise their achievements in an attempt to feel better about themselves, but they're so geared towards the elevation of others. And I've always seen that as a as a point of, a marker point for me in terms of just when I'm with every anybody, it doesn't matter whether you're in an airplane or not. When you're when you have a you have a dialogue with anybody, whether it's your mm. children, whether it's teachers at school, whether it's colleagues at work, whether it's the fueler, is just being interested in other people and wanting to to learn from them, regardless of whether the conversation, the dialogue is difficult or whether it's open. There's always a learning point, and I feel that very much because I know that my ego is taken hold of me in the past the shame thing of thinking well if I don't prove I'm right here then I'm not going to be good enough and so they then you just go into ego overdrive thinking yeah. okay well just don't don't give up don't admit you're wrong here and then of course you you, you wake up three o'clock in the morning thinking oh why did I do that why did I do that but again you get, <laughs> yes, that, for that wise stage, I think I'm a little bit wiser now but again I think I think there's another saying isn't there that you make more friends in 
two weeks or two months by being interested in other people than two years and trying to make other people interested in you. And I always think that when I've got flying with somebody new in the aeroplane, okay, if they, if they want to tell me I'm rubbish, that's absolutely fine. But we're going to, we'll hopefully we'll both learn, both learn something. Yeah. From that. I had a yeah. freelancer, funny enough, about 18 months ago, had a freelancer who was very defensive, did that classic thing of coming in, trying to say, trying, trying to prove how much he knew, and I could see it was from an insecure insecurity point of view. And um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting one. We were talking, for anybody who doesn't know about aviation so much, we have to start aeroplanes up in a particular way. And in the, on the Gulf Stream, one of the factors was, was uh, putting the cabin power on after the, the IRS is the, the part of the navigation systems. And he, we had an engineer in the back and he was briefing us on the fact that you had to wait 10 minutes before you put the right switches on. And he did completely the opposite. And so the, the engineer in the laugh in the back sort of laughed at him and that completely emotionally hijacked him. And it was a very uncomfortable atmosphere <laughs> for the next two days because, because yeah. he'd, he, he'd sent himself down this rabbit hole and we, we all, we did, we were there for 10 days and it, and it all worked out fine in the end, but it's one of those things. And it's, it's not having to prove anything, just knowing that, there's always an opportunity to learn something and being blokes yeah, just got to stick out. They were wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Yeah. Not very, not very easy I, I, blokes. I, I, I got a great piece of uh, advice um, when I finished my A-levels from the headmaster. Um, it wasn't just to me, I don't think. Uh, there's a whole load of us. And one of the one of the two bits of advice he gave us is that when you, when you make mistakes, um, admit it and say you're sorry. And he said, don't, probably don't say... I won't do it again because you probably will. And I thought actually that 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 takes a really strong person to do that. Um, and in the training world, one of the things trainers certainly seem trainers are particularly res, uh, resistant or reluctant to do, should we say, is go and demonstrate because suddenly you put yourself in jeopardy. And and certainly I, I remember um, demonstrating a circuit. And it was one of the worst circus I ever did. I was thrown on the deck. I said, sorry, guys, that was absolutely rubbish. <laughs> you know, you're coming in low and yeah. turned early. I said, that was just, yeah, I just saw, I made a thing like, come on, have a look at the instructor plot, see where I went wrong. That was absolutely rubbish. So I kind of went, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself here and we do it again. I did it properly. I said, I hope you learn, well, learn, learn, hopefully you learn out of both of those, actually, what, what bad looks like, what good looks like. So, but actually, you know, uh, we kind of made a bit of a laugh of it, but it is, is it damages, hurts your ego, but perhaps that's not a bad thing in that instance. Um, and to be able to laugh at yourself is, I think, actually diffuses the situation massively. Um, and then, you know, because then nobody feels they've got anything to prove. Um, but I think it, 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 it takes quite a brave or a confident person to actually get to the point where actually uh, um, I'm confident in my own skin that, okay, I'm, I'm not the best pilot. And I will make mistakes and screw it up with the best of them. But uh, hopefully I can see what I've gone wrong and learn why I've done it right. And, uh, and hopefully you as my crewmate will help me not make that mistake next time. So um, it's, I think it's, it's, in a way that's a more powerful lesson than being absolutely God's gift to fly. Well, it is really. And I always repeat this so often. Well, I tell my children I'm perfect, of course, but you know, <laughs> anybody that's perfect is extremely boring and very tedious and we know that anybody's always promoting their own achievements is becomes very boring and of course if you can laugh it takes humility it, it, you for me you're a very humble individual for you know what you've achieved but there's no there's no trying to shove that down anybody else's throat because it's not your value system your value system is how do we make things better for all of us and i think that's that's brilliant. At the end of the day, we've got to be we've got to be prepared to fail to learn. It's the best learner because again, it hits our emotions, doesn't it? When we when we get things wrong, immediately mm. we think, oh, God, there's a there's an existential threat here. I'm going to be abandoned by the tribe, and I'm going to be eaten by the lions. And I always go back to our basic operating system. But actually, well, no, of course we're not. Let's just develop our understanding, reflect properly, stick the hands up, defuse, as you say, defuse the situation. And then everybody moves on. Everybody moves mm. on. And I think or the you, you pointed out the fact that you're not a classic alpha male. I think I was unusual. I played a lot of sports like you. I played rugby to a reasonable level and cricket to a reasonable level and spent plenty of times with alpha males. But I was always 
the kind of person that wanted to get into the nitty gritty, the psychology of it and coming up against people who are very uncomfortable and still are uncomfortable of doing that is, is, has been a challenge, but actually, as I realize it's the most important thing, that's what helps me build the confidence because I can reflect on when things have gone wrong and say, okay, we've learned this. And when you get something wrong, I totally understand. Let's laugh about it together. And we'll move on. It's just and humility really is the key, isn't it? Just knowing that yeah. we're never going to get perfect. No, I, I, I read something about um, yeah, Alistair Cook, you know, great test batsman, but he always doubted himself. And you think, well, he's probably one of England's greatest ever batsmen. And if you're sitting there doubting yourself and, you know, he's got, oh, was he? Not bad for a nudger and a nerdler, I think he said to, about himself, but he was, you know, his own house. <laughs> A self-deprecating guy, but we've got like umpty um thousand, tens of thousands of test runs. Like, well, wow, wow. Can I, if, if he doubts himself, but has managed to achieve what he's achieved, like, you know, it is obviously a natural thing. I think there are maybe one or two kind of probably marginally psychotic people who don't doubt themselves, but I think pretty much yes. everybody else does. Yes. Um, and it's a question of of how you do that, and you, can you make that a positive thing? And you know. Certainly, probably when I was younger, it you know, it was a negative thing. Um, uh, you know, when when I was trading and doing my own conversion, sort of, it wasn't going well. Kind of looking for like, this is really going terribly. And I think your um your own natural, um, I'd say, as natural, certainly naturally for me, I'd say, is is you look at what you've done badly and what you've done wrong, and rather than saying, well, okay, that's the, you know, as you just said. But making mistakes is natural. Everybody makes mistakes, and actually, it's a brilliant learning experience. Um, uh, and I didn't see that as a brilliant learning experience. I just sort of saw it as kind of a, a very quiet, quick passage out to uh, find another job. But I, I probably, to be honest, wasn't particularly well supported by the trainer in that instance. Um, he was pretty old, old school and hard about it. But um, we, we got there in the end, and it was, it was actually you know hopefully you learn you become more resilient to the fact that okay i've done this done my opc or my lpc and my six monthly check over the last 10 years or five years and they've generally gone okay and i haven't at any stage been close to being sacked i might not have got them all right i made some mistakes but actually i'm okay at this so you know if you're going to screw it up fine you know that's just just take that on the chin and move on, which was yeah. always harder to do when you haven't got that experience behind you. Absolutely. And again, I think the trick is, as you did when you were effectively kicked out of the of the Air Force, you went to the instructors and said, am I good enough? You you didn't yeah. isolate yourself. You realised actually the value of getting balanced reflection from other people. And that's when we when we were emotionally hijacked and full of shame and egos and trying to defend ourselves, we we drag ourselves away from everything that's helpful, including our own inner, inner objectivity. But if we isolate ourselves from other people who can just say, hang on a minute, don't be a, don't be a pillock here. You're mm -hmm. absolutely perfectly capable. I'll, I'll tell you a story about me when I screwed this up or got that wrong. And you think, oh, okay, all right then. And it helps you out. And that's where that proper connection is. Never forgetting that there is a great, great, connection there and that's what i refer to in terms of, you know spiritual connection because emotional connection means we're understanding ourselves at a much higher level which then allows us to consider other people and you know that spiritual connection and it's just hugely beneficial against it comes it comes down to the enjoyment i think if mm. we can enjoy our life everybody else does around us yeah and i think you know part of my decision out of 2016 was actually oh, i would enjoyed doing management but actually become too much of a chore and not enough fun. Uh, and I enjoyed the fun of flying. Um, and, you know, the grass is always a little bit greener. So you go back in full time flying, think, oh, it's a little bit of a chore. <laughs> it's not all, uh, you know, roses, even on this side of the fence. But uh, I still get, you know, I still enjoy going to work, which is, uh, I appreciate I'm very lucky in that. And I think that's a great thing to do. Yeah, no, completely. I think the day that, what well, have you, Every now and then there is a day when you think, oh, geez, I've had enough here. But if you're continuing to feel that feeling over a period of time, it's time to have a proper stock take and realize what we should, that we're, perhaps it's time to go somewhere else. I think your word of resilience is brilliant. I mean, it's used a lot now and we could spend 
hours and hours dissecting resilience. But there's that decision. We've got to make that decision that we it's like I'm going to be more resilient. It doesn't mean to say I'm going to be a you know tough son of a whatever mm. and start kicking kicking everybody else's ass around. It's okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to understand things. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to go and listen to a podcast. I'm going to talk to a coach or a mentor or even a therapist or whatever. I've never been shy of going to those people because I think well. They're going to offer something to me. And you know, even if you pay for it, you think, well, I'm paying someone so that I can talk about myself for an hour. Mm. Why wouldn't we do that? There's plenty of people yeah. who wouldn't do that. So to, to be resilient and then see a way to push it forward to benefit other people as opposed to a self-protection thing, which en ends up being very prickly for everything, yeah. everybody else. I think that's the key to the, the idea about re resilience. Yeah, I think the, the um, let's say, you, when I when I um, left the Air Force, you know, I see an old instructor, and and actually, it, it it's kind of almost, and, and it's interesting. I see it with my kids. Um, they focus on what they haven't done well. Um, rarely believe the positive feedback it comes from me or my wife. Um, so actually, going in my case, it was going to see a kind of independent third party who said you did all right, or you know, when you reflect later on, you've done your OPC, and he actually said that was quite good. So there's no um, uh, kind of emotional. There's no reason why he should, he should lie, and he's got to do so many other tests uh, that actually you've got a kind of third party. That's kind of what I think for me built my resilience a bit was actually um, uh, having a, a third party say, "Actually, you're you're quite good, or you're okay, you're, or you're not bad, <laughs> you know, anything like that." It was good, um, and you know that 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 certainly was quite a good thing. And when you actually get or or you get held in the same regard as some people you think well, I know they're pretty decent so actually um, that's quite a nice thing to be told and that that builds your confidence and resilience and one fell swoop at this. yeah absolutely I think uh, yeah it's the key humility resilience and connecting making sure we don't disconnect from people it always comes mm. back to the same thing for me really but Martin it's been a great conversation and we're, we're definitely going to get back to this a bit yeah. more and if you but there's, there's a question I like to try and finish off with and you've probably answered it but I'm going to ask you more specifically so what would 50 year old 50 year old odd Martin say to the 20 something that got kicked out of the of the Air Force that would have helped yeah. you perhaps more than, than struggling in those in that period then what would you what would you say well yeah I, I, as you said, I think I think it is the kind of the it's the resilience and confidence and and maybe seek early. I mean, it probably took me twenty years to realise um, that actually, if you find some somebody or some positive feedback um, and uh, to to build your own confidence and res uh, resilience up, is it, kind of what I would have liked to say to myself. Is actually, you know, kind of believe in yourself a bit, and it's hard to believe in yourself. Uh, on your own, you need to go and find people you love or share, or whether professional or or non-professional. Just say you're, you know, you're you're a good bloke. You know, you're fun to be around. So why would they not want you to have a flight deck? Uh, if I want to have you in a flight deck or whatever. And you know, the, this this flying game is is more and more about personalities and um, fitting in and and being a team player and all those good kind of buzzwords. But actually, it's Basically, being a nice person and then being empathetic and supportive of others, and they likewise be supportive of you. And I think um, if if I perhaps had gone out and thought or believed or listened to even those guys were saying, actually, hey, you, why, 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 why are you worried about it? Well, I'm worried about because I'm doing very well. I guess. Well, you know, ex mistakes happen. Experiences have gained dust. You know. Um, so yeah, may may my journey a little bit less rocky. Yeah, I think that's love, lovely advice. One of the things that I encourage my coaching uh, clients to do is to actually have a, a compliments journal. Mm. So to write down when somebody says something nice, even if it's a tiny text message or just a, a comment in the shop. Mm. I, I try and compliment people on their smiles all the time because I think that really, that really changes the atmosphere so incredibly quickly. If a yeah. cashier on the desk a big smile, I tell her that or hit him or that because I just think that mm. we could have a big thing but what I su suggest to my clients is write those things down so when you're feeling doubtful when things are hitting when you're going through turbulence is go back to that and read through that big list inevitably yeah. of things that have been said 
I think that's really powerful. So anyway, thank you, Martin. This has been a wonderful conversation and we'll, we will return at some point, but uh, you're over in India. Enjoy the delicious food over there and I'll catch up with you soon. (laughs) All right. Love to see you again, Ben. Take care. Cheers, Martin. Take care. Bye-bye.